Well, there are approximately 21 million miles of roads in the world, ranging from wide open freeways to winding country lanes. And some of those drives are very peaceful, great for a beautiful Sunday afternoon, but some are simply terrifying. And while nightmares might happen on Elm Street, there are certain roads in the world that will make you say more than Jeepers Creepers. While they're not haunted by ghosts or goblins, these roadways will give you white knuckles. Of course, here in the U.S., we have that drive up Pikes Peak, which I've told you about our family's adventures this summer. And we have some other pretty scary drives here. But the rest of the world has some that are far more terrifying. In fact, consider the Gualiang Tunnel in China. This tunnel bores through a mountain and has ominously dark conditions with sheer drop-offs. Or what about the Atlantic Ocean Road in Norway? Crossing a group of islands, this road has intense driving conditions. In fact, the Atlantic Ocean often meets drivers with a great burst of water. And if maybe you've had no problem on Pikes Peak as a family yourself, you might want to travel to Pakistan and try the road to Ferry Meadows. Uh, this 6.2-mile road leads to, get this, the Killer Mountain. <laughs> That's if you make it. <laughs> Now, thankfully, most of us will never drive these roads. There are other roads, however, that we face every day. And they're not roads of concrete or asphalt, but we travel them nonetheless. And we've already talked about some of them in our series through James. The road of trials, the road of temptation, the road of blessing, the road to wisdom. But there is another road that we talk about today that is particularly scary, and that is the road of spiritual warfare. We face spiritual warfare with other people, within ourselves, and even with Satan. And we see the effects of this spiritual warfare in quarrels in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in our denominations, and even in our government. Interestingly, though, both sides of these quarrels <laughs> are unaware that they are simply pawns in the devil's scheme. Now, in many contexts, Satan doesn't have to do anything to attack us. He just encourages us to attack one another. While he just sits back and cheers us on while we destroy the greatest of families, governments, and even churches. Now, at some point, we've got to figure out how in the world we can fight these battles of spiritual warfare. Or maybe we just need to do what James taught us how to do 2,000 years ago. Uh, please turn to James chapter 4 if you haven't already. James here in chapter 4 is continuing his discussion about wisdom and foolishness that began back in chapter 3. And chapter 4 is an expansion of his teaching on the foolishness of worldly so-called wisdom. Here we find selfish desires, unchecked pride, and self-serving plans. And all result from spiritual warfare within us and around us. And so here today, James is going to show us that power for spiritual warfare comes in submission to God. He begins by looking at our selfish desires, and he says that you can have power in spiritual warfare by submitting your desires to God in prayer. Look at verses 1 through 3 of James chapter 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. So you kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, as with too many churches, the churches to whom James was writing were fighting. (laughs) Now, what were they fighting about? We don't really know. But we do know from the way James talks about it that this was a chronic problem, meaning they were fighting all the time. So while we may not know what they were fighting about, we can know why they were fighting because James tells us. James says the fights and quarrels came from desires that battled within them. The word desires actually has its roots in the word hedonism. Hedonism is that world philosophy that says that the chief purpose of life is self-gratification. So if we follow our own passions, though, chaos is inevitable. Wars and fighting come because we all desire the same thing or we desire opposing things. But whatever the case is, we all what we want and we want it now. That's the reason for the fights and everything from our government to our churches to our families. It's not about what's going on with the other guy. It's about what's going on inside of us. See, we don't always realize, though, that this battle is within us. These desires camp out deep inside our organs, really, is what James says. That's what within us means. So from deep inside us, there is this desire that launches out against anything and anyone who dares interfere with our gratification. We think we're fighting for justice, or we think we're rooting out theological problems, when in really... When really in reality, we're usually just after something for ourselves. James continues in verse 2 saying that you want what you want so bad that you're willing to do anything to get it. Now, James uses the word kill, which is strong. He doesn't mean literally that we murder someone, but he's saying that our quarrels are so bad to God, it's as if we were murdering people. We set God's law aside and consequently do things we would never dream of doing. Sadly, even after all of that envying and killing, we still don't get what we want. Our list of desires is long, but our list of fulfillments is empty. All around us is a mess of things where we have tried to make things happen according to our desires. But still our hands, while dirty, are empty. James here lays down a lesson. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And even when you do ask him, You ask with the wrong motives. I don't know, but that should feel a bit like this to all of us. It's meant to feel like a a punch in the face, a, a correction, a hit, where we realize that something has happened. If your desires are not God's desires, they are wrong desires. If you're not asking with the motives of God's name and God's kingdom and God's will and God's glory, you are asking for the wrong reasons because His name, His kingdom, His glory must be your passion. And you must also pray, you must also not pray formula, recited prayers, the same old thing always. Because if you do that, you're just trying to manipulate God. One commentator said these people that James was writing to were not like a trusting child who was simply asking for a meal. They were like a greedy child asking for the best piece or a spoiled child demanding his own way. And God will not tolerate 
Your desires must be submitted to God. Every desire for your family, every desire for yourself, every desire for your kids and grandkids, every desire must be submitted to God. And the way that you submit that desire is through prayer. You have not because you ask not, James says. And when you do ask, you ask with the wrong motives. But submitting to God in prayer opens the power of His will and His desires to be unleashed in your life. On Wednesday night, during prayer and praise, I mentioned a devotional book that our family is using at breakfast each day right now. And earlier this week, the devotional had to do with seeds. The amazing thing about seeds is they look dead because in effect, they are. But that one seed can produce a plant that then produces hundreds, if not thousands of other seeds that can then produce hundreds, if not thousands of other plants. But scientists can analyze and take apart the many chemical compounds within a seed. But still today, no scientist has ever been able to produce a synthetic seed. The devotional said this. This is because even the, quote, simplest seed is entirely too complex for mankind to reproduce. It will never happen. Only when that seed that is created by God is touched by soil and water, amazing creations by God in their own right, does that seed produce life. Your desires are like that seed. Until it is submitted in prayer to God deep in the soil of His will and watered by the desires of His heart, it will never grow. Instead of planting seeds in our prayers, though, too often we just kind of scatter them on the ground. And then we offer a incantation blessing over them. Oh, bless this, Lord. Bless this, Lord. Essentially, it's like saying, abracadabra, bibbidi-boppidi-boo, make something happen. And that never works. See, instead, we need to dig deep in prayer. Because when you come to God in prayer, you've got to turn over new ground. You've got to get in there. You've got to lay down your desires. You lay down your identity. You lay down your family. You lay down your career. You lay down your finances. You lay down your friends. You lay it all down. And you say, God, here are my desires. But as you will and desire. And then you tend that garden in prayer, continuing to submit yourself and your desires to God every single day. Submission in prayer, though, is scary. But it's not near as scary as the mess you're in if you keep quarreling. Because when you submit your desires to God in prayer, you enter the place of true fulfillment. It's there when your desires are submitted to God's desires that you find that His desires become your best desires and your personal best desires become worthless. God wants to immerse you in blessings. But those blessings come when you're immersed in Him. Do you know why life is just meh? For a lot of people, it's because they've never surrendered their desires to the Lord. And so while they have everything the world has to offer, their life is still just... And Satan has them right where he wants them. Beat down, defeated, and always trying to get something else. But you can have power in spiritual warfare... (laughs) When you submit your desires to God in prayer, then you can look out. Next, James says you can have power in spiritual warfare when you submit your pride to God in repentance. As if it wasn't hard enough submitting our desires to God, now James goes right after our pride. Look at verses 4 
through 10. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that the spirit he calls to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Now, often when we talk about spiritual warfare, we just pull out verses 7 through 10 right out of this passage and we focus on them. But those are part of James's larger discussion and we really can't understand them effectively if we don't take them in context. Notice here as we take them all together how it all works of submitting your pride to God in repentance. And that's where some power for spiritual warfare comes. In verse 4, James begins by calling these people adulterous. Now, that doesn't mean that they were cheating on their spouses. It simply means that they were cheating on God. They were committing spiritual adultery against God. And when we become friends with the world, we become enemies of God. We, We cannot cozy up to the world. Because when you cozy up to the world, you soon become controlled by the world. God is fiercely jealous. Now, it's not a bad jealousy. It's a righteous jealousy. But it's because God has invested so much in us that he cannot stand for us to have divided loyalties. He wants all of us, not just a part of us. Though he is a jealous God, He is a gracious God as well. He gives us grace when we fail Him. In fact, verse 6 says God gives us more grace or He gives us greater grace. The greater our need, the greater His grace. And yes, it is amazing every single day. That's why God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. The proud have turned their hearts away from God, and so God then opposes them, which means that he draws a line in the sand and he approaches them as adversaries. You don't want to be across a line that God draws in the sand. But thankfully, you don't have to be. Because while God opposes the proud, he gives grace to the humble. And that's where we want to be. The humble have realized their dependence on God, and they have submitted to Him. Now, say in dependence and submission and humility, please don't understand humility and submission as being beat down or weak. In fact, those words have the idea of simply coming under an authority that is greater. So... A soldier is submitted to the authority of his commanding officer. A powerful horse is submitted to the authority of its rider. Humility and submission intensify power rather than nullifying power. In fact, we see that happen in verses 7 through 10, those verses we normally talk about when we talk about spiritual warfare. James says, when we submit ourselves to God... We can resist the devil. And here's what happens. When we submit ourselves to God, instead of him drawing a line against us, as he does with the proud, he draws a line against the devil. That word, resist the devil, is the same word used in the verse before for God opposes the proud. It's that draw a line in the sand, treat as an adversary. So when we draw near to God, he and we draw a line in the sand opposing the enemy and he must flee. But always remember, the power is not you. It is the one who is with you. And the one who is in you. If you came across this cute little lion cub in the wild, you might be tempted to approach. Look at that sweet little thing. Let me see if I can go pet that. 
But if you saw mama with it, you wouldn't quite know what to do. I bet you would turn and flee. Submit to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee. Because God's right there behind you. Many Christians are spiritually powerless because they have failed to submit to God. And then they have failed to do what James says next, which is come near to God and God will come near to you. That's a picture of worship. But that is not just showing up at church on Sunday, singing some hymns, and listening to a sermon. It is engaging with God in the privilege of worship through a conversation with Him. And realizing the wonderful privilege we have of going into the throne room of Almighty God. We don't have to send somebody else in for us. We get to go into the Holy of Holies ourselves and draw near in worship. And when we do, God draws near to to us. Please don't miss what God wants to do in you every time we gather for corporate worship. And please don't miss what God wants to do in you when you draw near to Him in private worship. Draw near to God so that He can draw near to you. But perhaps the reason we don't always draw near to God is because we don't do the next thing either. In verses 8, the second part of verse 8 on through 10... James challenges us by saying, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail, change your laughing to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. It's a picture of repentance. Washing our hands is an act of repentance of our actions on the outside. Purifying our hearts is a picture of repentance of, of actions on the inside. James is alluding to Psalm 24... Verses 3 and 4 here that says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. Clean it up, outside, inside. Verse 9 goes further. It says, we need to get upset over our sin. We need to get serious with God. We need to lay it all out there. We need to cry our eyes out, do business with God because that's godly sorrow that pushes us to repentance. And only when we fully repent can we be fully restored. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. It's a picture of someone who is just laying there prostrate before the king, needing to be forgiven, needing to be redeemed, And the king gets up from the throne and he steps down and he reaches down to that penitent person and he picks him up out of the dust and he restores him. And that person can leave that place with grateful joy knowing that he is forgiven. God, humble yourselves. But Satan doesn't want us to do that. And so that's why he always attacks us at our pride. Every sin goes back to me, myself, and I. In the middle of the English word sin is a big I, and that's where Satan attacks. Now he finds different things for all of us. For some of us, he tempts us with things we put inside our bodies, like food or drink or drugs. For others of us, he he tempts us with things we put around our bodies, like money and stuff. For others, he tempts us with things we do with our bodies, like experiences or sexual promiscuity. But it all taps our pride. It all goes after us. You know, Coach Ed Orgeron had everything the world had to offer. Now, a headline in Sports Illustrated reads, The Swift Fall of Ed Orgeron at LSU. Less than two years after he led one of college football's greatest seasons, Coach O is now out of his dream job. The article quotes an unnamed source close to the football program with saying this, You get on top and you start to live differently. And that's when the fall happens. 
Here's a coach who finally, after decades in the game, achieves the maximum goal. But when you achieve it, it's my problems are done. No, success sometimes isn't an end to a problem. It's the beginning of more. You see, the same thing that got Coach O is the same thing Satan uses to get us. may not be all over the news, but he's coming after us every day. So don't be too hard on Coach O. Let it be a check for yourself in what God, what God needs to do in your life. You've got to fall on your face before God and say, I'm done. Forgive me. In case you think you can point fingers to someone else, don't. Uh, you don't have any right to judge others, and James tells us so in the next couple of verses, verses 11 and following. He says, brothers... Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, (laughs) who are you to judge your neighbor? You deal with you. Let God deal with everybody else. You have enough to repent of yourself. You can only have power in spiritual warfare when you submit your pride to God in repentance. And now James takes us one step further. He says you can have power in spiritual warfare when you submit your plans to God in surrender. Look at verses 13 through 16. He says, now listen. You who say, tomorrow or today we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, You boast and brag. All such boasting is evil. James uses an illustration as he so often does. It's an illustration of a businessman who has made his plans. He's made his plans for the future, where he's going to travel, what he's going to do, the plans for his profits, the next step he's going to do. And his planning is not bad. God wants us to plan. His goals are not necessarily bad. God wants us to set goals. The problem is he left God out of his plans. And he left God out of his goals. Only God has sure knowledge of the future. Only God knows where we're going to be tomorrow, five years from now, ten years from now, twenty years from now. Only he knows the future. That is why we must not leave God out of our plans. We must consult him. All of our plans must be laid at the feet of Christ and his will. We must go through every day humbly submitted to whatever God has next. Some of you know, but not all of you know, that for a couple of years in high school, every Saturday, I came right here to this organ and took... uh, organ lessons from Mason Campbell. Mason Campbell was the organist here for the church for many, many decades. And when I was taking organ lessons, he was in his mid-80s, I would guess, and suffering from some different uh, ailments. And every time that lesson would end, he would say, well, I'll see you next week unless providentially hindered. That could mean... He might be here, he might not. That could mean God had other plans. It was Mr. Campbell's way of saying, I'm putting it in the Lord's hands. If it's the Lord's will, we'll be here next week. We must submit our plans to God in surrender. And we cannot boast and brag about our plans. That is evil. The life of the follower of Christ must be about following Christ. Your plans must be his plans. The map of your life must be his map for your life, wherever that leads you. And I guarantee you that wherever that leads you will be best because as God said through the prophet Jeremiah, his plans are to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. 
Somewhere in the video library of heaven, if such things exist, is a conversation Rebecca and I had in our parsonage in Forestburg, Texas, while I was pastoring there. And during that conversation, we were talking about one day, decades down the road, we hoped that we would be pastoring in Louisiana again. But not in central Louisiana. <laughs> Shreveport, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, eh, not New Orleans, uh, somewhere else. We, but not, no, not central Louisiana. Then we went into a conversation about the churches in central Louisiana, since we knew them so well, and we started listing them off and what was happening there. And First Baptist Church, Pineville, no way. We went on, and then came 2008. And God said, hey, you know that area of Louisiana you said you'd never go to? You know that church you said no way to? Well, way. <laughs> and you know what? It's been way better than any of our plans could have been. Because for the last 13 years, God has guided and he's blessed. And it's been a wonderful thing. You see, when we follow God's map for our life, it's always the best map. We can plan and we can work and we can try to connive, but what we need to do is just surrender our plans to God and let him take over. You can have power in spiritual warfare when you submit your desires to God in prayer, when you submit your pride to God in repentance, when you submit your plans to God in surrender. But now look at verse 17. Anyone then... Who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now that's a challenging verse. Because as I read that and reflected upon it this week, I thought, you know, there are a lot of Sundays when a lot of us, including I, walk out of here knowing what we should do, but not doing it. There are days when we get up from our quiet time and we know what we need to do, but we don't do it. And James reminds us that not doing what you should do is sin in the same way that doing what you shouldn't do is sin. We like to talk about the things we shouldn't do, but what about the things we should do? So today, what's it going to be? Will you do the good you know to do? Will you submit all of these things to the Lord so that he can do spiritual warfare on your path? Or will you just continue to ignore God's will? Will you continue to just go through life and hope it works out, try to make things happen, and do it on your own? The greatest blessings come when we surrender to the Lord. 